legible, so I can actually because I typed it up, so I can actually uh, type it up and not finesse them. So you can sign that in whenever. Actually, we're not password now, so I'll just handle it better. But uh, without any further ado, Carla. Okay. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you. Okay. Um, first off, a couple pieces of information. I like to keep my talks as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, let me know. Um, it also gives me a good handle on whether I'm putting you in the sleep or not. So, uh, as Carlos mentioned, this talk is going to be on website accessibility and what does it mean. Um, mention my name, Mike Barlow, my email address is up there if you need to contact me. If anybody is a member of Tech, Tech Lancaster, like Carlos is, I'm also on the Slack channel there. And I am also what is referred to at times as an ally SME. Ally, A-1-1-Y, is the abbreviation for accessibility. You take the word accessibility, you take the A, you take the Y, and you've got 11 letters in the middle of it. So you get an A-1-1-Y. SME for subject matter expert. That's more of a government acronym than a common usage one. But it just means here is someone who knows something about this subject. So. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this and switch over to my web browser. Turn my speakers on. Okay, and I'm going to show you a website. Table. And I want everybody to take a look at this website and tell me what you think about it in about two minutes. New Tech A11Y September 2016 Google Slides document blank. A simple example document. Heading level one, welcome to the desert of the real. Simple example. Heading level one, welcome to the desert of the real. A dark, destroyed cityscape image. Heavy cloud cover with only a smattering of breaks to reveal a bright light beyond. The image is representational of a scene from the movie The Matrix where Morpheus presents Neo with what the real world looks like today. Heading level 2, what's this all about? This line was taken from the first Matrix movie. Strinsky, volume 2. Okay, so if you were a blind person, that is how you would see this website that I just put together. If you are not a blind person, that is what you would see. The whole idea behind accessibility is making websites or any type of information available and accessible to individuals no matter what disability they might have. So that's the example for this. We'll get back on to the, uh, the actual presentation. Not a good thing for a freshman to do 
to a PhD in calculus, especially on the first day of class. But it pointed out what disabilities are and the impact that they can have. Up to 20% of people are affected by some form of disability, be it needing glass, be it color blindness, be it uh, dyslexia, or almost any type of impairment, physical, mental, what have you. Um, a significant portion of these people can benefit from websites designed with accessibility in mind. Uh, if you're designing a website that has a lot of colors on it, you need to make sure that those colors are distinct for individuals with color blindness. Um, in this country alone, there are over 52 million people with some form of disability. Uh, that means that on the planet, there are over one billion. Now that's a significant number, even 52 million. If you're designing a website, um, how would you like to immediately gain access to another 52 million people to see what you're doing on that website? Um, what does it mean to be accessible? Well, there are a number of standards out there that define what you can do to make a website accessible. There are standards that define the things that need to be done. Who needs accessible websites? Well, virtually anybody. Here we have Adam, who is a technical writer. Um, he has no problems using computers normally, but he has arthritis, uh, which, by the way, I have too. And arthritis is one of those types of disabilities that you may not start out with it, but as time goes on, you may get a disability. A lot of times, younger people don't need glasses. As you get older, you start needing glasses. If you don't have arthritis, age kicks in, you start getting arthritis. So this man, Adam, sometimes has a hard time using a mouse, so he has to use everything with a keyboard. Uh, sometimes he turns on voice recognition. So rather than even using the keyboard, he can just sit there and dictate to his computer. A la Scotty in Star Trek. Hello, computer. <laughs> the days of Star Trek, that was science fiction. Today, that is science fact. That is reality. Um, Anja, nurse practitioner. She has attention deficit disorder. Uh, reading and writing is a little more difficult for her. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, presentations or websites that put up what's called a slideshow or a carousel. You'll see a slide, and then a couple of seconds later that slide will pass off to something else. How annoying is it if you're trying to read that slide and right in the middle of reading it, it just slides off the screen and you're stuck. You have no idea what was going on. You have to fumble to try and get back to that slide. Um, Emma. Poor eyesight, tunnel vision. She has to take and look at a computer through a magnifying glass. Nowadays, there are built-in methods where you can zoom in on web pages, change the size of fonts by default, change the color of fonts by default. Um, Mark, he is blind. He has to do everything looking at computer screens such as the first example that I gave you but he keeps using the web every day. Another gentleman I always like to give an example of, Stephen Hawking. I'm sure everybody here has heard of this gentleman. He has advanced ALS. He's confined to a wheelchair. Um, he uses thumb switch, blink controls. He has a control by his cheek where a twitch of the cheek can help him do things. Um, as I've told a number of people, if you can design a website that Stephen Hawking can use, you've designed an accessible website. Um, any questions so far before I go on? Anybody still awake? Are you asleep? Okay. Why should I worry about it? Well, there is something called the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA is a federal law enacted in 1990. Uh, prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Um, it was back in the early 90s that we started seeing ramps go 
go on building so that people with wheelchairs could gain access to the buildings and wouldn't have to climb stairs. Um, however, in 1990, the internet was just in its infancy. Websites didn't really exist yet. So there was no concern about making websites accessible. As a matter of fact, at that time, websites were typically only text. They didn't have a lot of the functionality that you see today. So the ADA had nothing to do with websites, internet. However, in recent years, there have been a number of lawsuits enacted by individuals, organizations, such as the National Federation for the Blind. And for example, in 2006, Target settled a class action lawsuit alleging that their website was inaccessible to the blind in violation of the ADA. That was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. More recently, you've got a blind woman suing Red Wolf Inns for an inaccessible, inaccessible website. Legal action against the NBA, National Basketball Association, because their website was inaccessible. And so on and so on. If you try to go to uh, Toys R Us and order something uh, there for niece, nephew, what have you, and you can't order it because their website is inaccessible because of whatever disability you may have, you are denying the public access to your store, to your electronic storefront. That is a direct violation of the ADA. Um, it doesn't only involve stores. For example, Arizona State University, um, their course books are available in paper but it took months after the course book was delivered before those course books were made available in ebook format for people with Kindles. So now you have a blind student who is going to take a course and he is denied the course material necessary for him to take that course. You're denying that individual an education because he can't get the material. Florida State University, an accessible math courses cost that, that university $150,000. Harvard, MIT, not exactly small, multi-million dollar lawsuits uh, because their students were looking for better webcasting. Uh, Louisiana Tech University, the Law School Admissions Council. Now you would think a law school would be very sensitive about following the letter of the law. Their applications were inaccessible to students with disabilities, cost them nine million dollars. Now you would have thought hey, they could have gotten a benefit by having their own students fight the case. Um, Pennsylvania State University also, their library website, their course material systems were all inaccessible. And the, the list goes on and on. There is lawsuits going on every day. In most cases, the suit isn't so much that the victims could get money out of it. In most cases, the, uh, the victims are looking, make this website accessible to me. Make your course material accessible. Allow me to do what I want to do with what you are making available to the general public. So it all comes down to if you design your website so that it's accessible to start with, then you're probably not gonna get a lawsuit telling you you have to go fix it. You're gonna save time and money in legal fees, in court battles, and you'll have something that the public will like to start. Questions so far? Okay, so as I mentioned, the um, ADA didn't have anything to do with the internet back in the day, and technically right now there are no laws on the book that require any public entity, such as Toys R Us, universities, what have you. Oh, universities, no, I take that back. Places like Toys R Us, Red Roof Inn, uh, any publicly accessible organization. There are no laws enacted that require them to be accessible. Theoretically, um, Toys R Us could have won that lawsuit. Theoretically, a lot of other places could have won the lawsuit against the National Federation for the Blind, because there is no law stating that it has to be. However, the Department of Justice has come out and said that compliance 
with voluntary technical standards has been insufficient in providing access to individuals with disabilities. Therefore, they are enacting a law that would require public entities, public accommodations, and so on and so forth, to make their sites accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. Um, this law was supposed to be enacted in April of this year, 2016. However, they pushed it back so that it has been delayed until 2018. But because that law is pending on the books, it means there are gonna be a lot more organizations trying to fight to get it done. And at the same time, it's giving organizations a chance to get a head start on making their sites accessible before they're required by law to do. Let's take a quick look at an example website. I actually found this. I really like this website. Oh, man. Anybody recognize this website? Text. Um, 
all non-textual elements on a page are required to have some form of alternative text. If you're displaying an icon and you're a blind person, you don't see that icon, so you don't know what that icon is supposed to represent. But there's a way of putting alternative text or images that will allow you to describe the image. Um, there are spacer images which are missing alternative text. That's acceptable, but you still need to have some type of alternative text indicator, meaning inside the image tag, you have to have alt equals quote, quote. Um, form labels. Uh, if you're using audio to listen to the rendition of a form, all input fields are required to have labels. Otherwise, when you move into a field, how do you know what this field is supposed to be asking for? Um, and there are various other texts. Now, Wave is a free plugin um, that is available from one of the sites online that you can add to your Chrome browser. But let's take a look at another tool. There's another tool that I like uh, called Apps. This one is put out by a company by the name of DQ. Um, and it also goes through a website and does an analysis of it. And it will tell you that, um, for example here, elements must have sufficient color contrast. For individuals who are colorblind or have poor color visibility distinctions, you need to have what's called a minimum level of contrast between two different colors. So if you have a purple something over a blue something, unless the purple color has sufficient contrast to the blue, it's considered inaccessible. And there are tools that you can go in and say, okay, here's one color that I'm using, here's the second color, so here's my foreground, here's my background, what's the contrast between those two colors? And it'll tell you if it's accessible or not. Um, but the nice thing about uh, Axe is you can actually go through and it'll show, okay, here we have an element, a span tag, select language that is floating over something. The contrast between those two elements isn't necessarily clear, and I can actually now go through and highlight that element in the source code and say, okay, show me where it is, and find it. Now, additionally, I can come in here and there's, here's another one here. Um, this block over here, your news panel, your events panel, your student alumni spotlight, they're basically lists. They're all done with DL elements. And if you can read any of this text here, it says DL elements must only directly contain properly ordered DT and DD groups, script or template elements. It's telling you that the HTML that is used to render those unordered lists is not rendered correctly. All that they have is a DL containing DDs. Now, a DL can contain a DD, but it also must contain a DT. So think of a, uh, a table with a term and a definition. That's what the DL tag is used for. It's actually a dictionary link. So whenever you have a term in a dictionary, Apple, you need to have a definition for that term. The use of the DLs and DDs on this site is used incorrectly. A simple unordered list, ULs and LI, would have been sufficient. But in looking at this, the site is telling you here's a problem, but you can also click a more info, which will take you right to DQ's accessibility page and tell you this is the problem in more detail. This is the tag that you're using. This is how you should be using it. This is why you're using it wrong. So remember earlier I mentioned uh, glass assignment. Uh, can you guess what that class assignment would probably be? Take a look at the MU uh, homepage.
page and try and make it accessible. Okay. That's, that's a I big mean, assignment. It, well, it's not necessarily a big assignment. You've got the website set up there. Um, by the end of this presentation, you'll know all the tools, you'll know all the guidelines that need to be met. It shouldn't be too hard to go through, find, use the tools to analyze the site, find out what's wrong, and then make the changes. For example, on your navigation sections, instead of using DLs and DDs, use ULs and LIs. Relatively simple change. And I'm not even suggesting publishing it out on the Millersville site, but it's something to take into account. Right now, your website is inaccessible to individuals with disabilities. It is leaving you guys open to a lawsuit, I'm sorry to say. You know, so it's definitely something that I would consider pointing out, taking a look at, and as a, an exercise, trying to make at least the homepage accessible, then talking to whoever is responsible for the website as a whole, pointing that out and saying, hey, you know, here's what we gotta do. So, um, questions, comments, thoughts, on looking at the website? Nobody. I must be swimming. Um, okay, um, let's go back. Anything else that you, uh, you notice about our website that seems to be like seriously inaccessible? Besides, because I, I, I think looking at it, uh, being able to tap through the whole website seems to be that alone is already an issue. Um, it is, but it's actually a lot better than there was one website I did for one of the guys uh, at uh, Tech Lancaster, his company had a, um, a grocery store that they were doing a website for. And he showed it to me, and typically the first thing I do when I go to a website, go to the start of the website and start hitting tab. Okay? That tells me almost immediately, you know, if there's major problems or minor problems. I went to the website, tab, 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 tab. I went all over the page, you know, and no two keystrokes of tab were in sequence. When you're tabbing through a site, when you're tabbing through a page, you start at the top left and you navigate. Tab, 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 left to right, top to bottom, just like you're reading a book. If your navigation can't do that, it's in violation. Other violations I saw on the page. You had each one of your navigational elements, your news on the left, your two on the right. Each one of them started with an H1 tag, a heading tag, because the developer said, hey, I like the way an H1 tag looks. Wrong. Heading tags are headings. Every page should have one and only one heading tag, a heading one tag. Basically, that's going to be the title of the page. So your H1 should be Millersville University, typically your logo. Then you need to nest your heading tags appropriately. An H1 contains H2s. An H2 will contain H3s. An H1 should not contain an H3 before an H2. So they have to be nested in numeric sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they should represent headings on the page, just like headings on a newspaper, rather than use them to, hey, this thing looks good. Okay, you make things look good with style sheets. You don't make them look good because of headings. Um, so, um, as I said, is my website accessible? How you can find out if the site is accessible? Um, the WAVE evaluation tool I mentioned, it's available at wave.webaim.org. Um, it's available in Chrome and also in Firefox. Um, the second one I showed you, the Axe extension, that is from pq.com, uh, and that's available in Chrome and Firefox as well. There's also the color contrast check. <coughs> so, now we get into the nitty gritty. What standards are there? I have to make my website accessible. How do I know how to make it accessible? What do, 
What are my rules? Section 508. Um, if you are working for the state or federal government and universities fall under the state or federal government since they receive federal funding, they are required by federal law to be compliant with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act enacted in 1973 relating to accessibility standards applied to electronic information technology that is used by the federal government. Uh, that lists 16 separate items which must be met to be in compliance. I've already mentioned some of them. Um, heading tags, alternate text, um, things like that. And there, even though there are 16 separate items, there are literally hundreds of sub-items. And if you really want to get into it, section508.gov, and there's also a really nice checklist that if you are working for the federal government and you need to use 508, that checklist is invaluable because you can actually configure that checklist and say, hey, I'm interested in doing these things. I'm interested in making it accessible at this level. I'm using this type of technology. And it will filter down all the requirements so that it only presents you with what you need to work with for the site that you're working on. So, for example, if you do not have multimedia on your site, if you don't have videos or audio files, you don't need to worry about captions and things like that. So you check off, you know, we're not using multimedia, and it pulls all those standards out of the 508 um, guidelines for you. And then webaim.org also has their own individual checklist, which is good reading material. Um, now, the most recent revision of 508 was done in 1998 and released in 2000. That's 16 years ago. Or in terms of internet years, that's about 85 years. And internet years come about by looking at how fast technology advances. And they actually compared it to the automotive industry when the automotive industry was coming about you know, a new generation of cars came about every so often. Uh, you know, think of it in dog years. Um, so a normal human generation is 25 years. If a new car comes out every 12 and a half years, well, that's two generations of cars per human generation. So it comes down to like two car years per calendar year. In terms of the internet, you've got about 4.7 years for a uh, calendar years for internet generations. So you've got 4.7 years of computer technology to every calendar year. Um, and there's actually, some guy actually sat down and calculated it and explained it a lot better than I could. And there's a link to his site and how he did it. Um, second, so 508 has to do with federal government standards. Um, if you're not the federal government, you don't need to worry about it. And frankly, even though I have worked for the federal government, I don't like worrying about it. Their standards are too obtuse. They're difficult to understand by people in the industry, in the government. And in most cases, most people don't even comply with it. It was amazing. A couple of years ago, I started doing research and found some small government websites like whitehouse.gov was not accessible by 508 standards. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> Come on, guys. So um, another set of standards, which um, the new versions of Section 508 are looking to be compliant with what's called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, if you don't like spelling the whole thing out. Um, the current version of WCAG, WCAG 2.0, came out in December of 2008, which is only a little over one internet generation ago, not quite two. But you've got uh, WCAG and the W3C's WAI, Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, and there's also a side-by-side -side comparison between WCAG and Section 508. So, 
these sites give you uh, a good insight into the accessibility guidelines, the kind of things you need to do, the uh, tips and techniques to even go through code examples. You know, If you're doing alt tags for images, here's the kind of things you need to do. If you're doing a uh, alt text for a logo, it's different than an alt text for a photograph. If you're doing alt text for a photograph, depending on the context of that photograph or image on the page, the alt text could be different. For example, if you have a photograph of two people walking on the beach in the sunset, um, this image could be on a senior citizen's vacation site, in which case it might have an entirely different context than you know, a spring break uh, vacation site. So the same image, two entirely different sets of alt text to describe what that image is to the individual looking for that website. Um, as I mentioned, there is a proposed ruling to update the accessibility requirements for the 508 um, that they have put out. If anybody is interested in reading it, you're more than welcome to. I skimmed through it. I don't want to read through it. Um, there is a WCAG quick reference for tips on how to make your site accessible and go through. Um, some of the basic outlines for making the website accessible. Um, there are a series of uh, guidelines that consist of four principles. A website to be accessible must be perceivable. If you can't see the website, the website's no good. If you can see it, even if you're not using your eyes, you've got a good starting point. It must be operable. You need to be able to navigate the website. If you're filling out a form and you can't fill out the form, it's no good to you. Must be understandable. There is a whole section that I didn't even go into describing about the text used on a website. If your website is intended for the layman, then the language used on that website must be understandable by the layman. If you're using any kind of acronyms, if you are doing a website and you have SME on there or A11Y, you need to explain A11Y means this and SME means that. Or the individuals reading through your website will have no idea what you're talking about. Now, that means that the language of your website must be understandable by individuals going to that website who understand the concepts of what that website is talking about. If you have a website about cosmology for PhD level students, you don't need to worry about explaining each little intricate detail so that you know a sixth grader could understand it. But the language on the website must be understandable by bachelor level cosmologists. Uh, it must be robust, meaning it must be able to work on as many different technologies as possible. Uh, up until a few years ago, that wasn't as hard as it is today. Uh, so a few years ago, most people would just access websites on their desktop or laptop computers. Nowadays, people are accessing them on tablets, on iPhones, on Android phones. Um, using Braille readers, uh, which is something else I didn't even get into, the different types of uh, assistive technology that's available to people today. Um, blind people don't always have to go with audio displays like NVDA that I was running at the beginning. Um, they have Braille devices. You can get a little Braille device that's literally smaller than a cell phone that has pins that come up when you're scanning over a page. So they would use their fingers to navigate the page by just reading the Braille on these little devices. So you need to make sure that your website is accessible on as wide a range of devices as possible these days as well. Conformance requirements. Um, I mentioned that you know, WCAG has 
their guidelines. There are various levels of conformance you can also make. There, for WCAG, there's three levels. There's A, double A, and triple A. Level A is the lowest standard you can have to consider a website accessible. Level AA is the standard by which most people attempt to meet. Level AAA is almost never met. You can have level AAA accessible for a given page, but for an entire website, it's almost impossible because their standards are too stringent. Now, when you're developing a website, you typically want to have what's called an accessibility statement somewhere on your website. Typically, you're going to have a link to your accessibility statement on your footer of your website. That statement is going to say, our website was designed to be conformant with these accessibility guidelines, blah, blah, blah. Google accessibility statement, you can find a half a dozen or more you know, standard accessibility statements put on a website. That is where you would typically say, our website is WCAG 2.0 level A conformant or level AA conformant. I will also tell you that if you have a website that has an accessibility statement that states you're a level A conformant to a CAG 2.0 and can prove that by passing through all the basic tests that are needed, basically run through the, the sequences I did, you know, tap through a page, run acts, run wave, um, and you know, can demonstrate that you're meeting level A conformance you are probably not going to get sued. The reason being, you've got proof that you have made an effort to make your website accessible. Is it accessible to everybody? Probably not. But a lawyer is not going to try and fight a case where you have some type of accessibility statement because they know you put forth an effort. Chances are, all they're going to do is say, send a letter to whoever the website owner is and say, hey, my client, Mr. So-and-so, was attempting to access your website and he found these problems. Letter to the webmaster. In most cases, if the webmaster has already at least tried to make their website compliant, if somebody points out to him, you missed this, most cases they'll try and rectify it. Most cases it's easy to rectify if the website was designed with accessibility in mind from the start. So um, would that count, like if you, if Motorsport was to take like a statement and then put it on the website and leave it as is, would that be accessible? No. Nope. Or not? Okay, I didn't think so. Because anybody could go to that website, hey, here's an accessibility statement, and try two or three simple, quick, tests and find out, nope, they didn't even try to meet the standards. Okay, If you can demonstrate that you have at least met some of the standards and maybe missed an obscure one on one section of your site, that would make a difference. Okay, And accessibility statements have to do with whatever part of the site you're talking about. You can say, our home page is accessible. Great. You stated that your home page is accessible, but that does not mean the rest of your site is accessible. You can say, our website is accessible except for this or that in your accessibility statement. Um, and again, there is another document that understanding conformance and everything that goes on with it. The, um, the WCAG website has probably three or four hundred different guidelines. Now, they only have like 16 or so main bullet points, but they have sub points under them. You know, bullet point one. Um, alternative text for non-textual items on a web page. There's level A conformance to that. There's level AA conformance to that. There's level AAA conformance to 
alternative text for non-textual elements on a website. So you've got the high level, you've got the medium level, and then you've got the really down and dirty nitty gritty, which can take forever to go through. But because there are so many different disabilities and because so many individuals are too happy in a lot of cases, the guidelines have to try and be as complete and succinct as possible. Um, useful web pages, JAWS. JAWS, for some reason, is the most popular screen reader that is available. Um, the first site that I demoed at the beginning, uh, I was using what's called a screen reader that will present information that is on a page to the user by having the computer synthesize a voice to read the information on the page. And in most cases, screen readers work pretty good. Um, I did not do very much to that web page I put together to have the screen reader read it. The only thing I really did was I put a series of alternative text for that top image at the top of the page. Everything else was just, I put a heading tag that gave a title for the page. I put you know, a bunch of paragraph tags with information on the page. The screen reader took all that right off the web page and read it as it was. The screen readers are intelligent enough to go if it sees an unordered list with links on it. It will tell you this is a list of five items containing links. First link takes you to here. Second link takes you to there. Third link takes you to there. So as you're navigating using your screen reader, typically with your tab key, because if you're using a screen reader, you're probably visually impaired. But the mouse works just as well with the screen reader. So you may be able to use a mouse on a website, but the clarity of the information, because your vision is so skewed, might not be the best. So you can use a mouse to navigate around, and the screen reader will read whatever the mouse is over. Yeah? Um, for the screen reader, in terms of links, It'll read the text. I'm assuming it'll read the text of the link. So if it said con uh, send us a message, and that links to their contact page on a website, would that would it read the URL and the href as well? Yes. So it will a link. The screen reader will read the text that is associated with that link. Will also read HTTP www.google.com or whatever your URL is. We'll also read whatever other information you have associated with. For example, um, there is something called an acronym tag or an abbreviation tag. Um, if you have MU and you have that wrapped in an acronym tag, the screen reader, reader will read MU acronym Millersville University because in your acronym tag or abbreviation tag, you have said the title equals Millersville University. So we will read the title element of your acronym tag that is wrapped around whatever the acronym is. Anything else? Okay. Uh, yeah. How would you also treat the DL tags that you were mentioning earlier? Since uh, would, it just, would it still be able to read those? Or yeah, um, the, the website I did with the image. I've got the H1 tag, welcome to the desert of the real. So when the 
screen reader was reading that, it would start out and read that. Um, notice it, I don't have an image tag here. I've got a body. I've got body hidden, a div, an h1, another div class hidden. If you were to look at my CSS, you would see desert of the real class as a background image, desert of the real. So in this case, I had an image that I did not have an alt attribute associated with it because the image was part of the background. Now, whenever you're putting images on a page, if they're for presentation purposes, you don't really need contextual information about it. Because a lot of times you're using it, you know, background graphics having nothing to do with the real context of the page. Um, in this case, I decided, okay, here I was putting a, an image on the page that really had something to do about the page. So I decided to put it inside of the div class. Now that text is not visible on the page itself. because I'm actually using CSS to throw it off screen using a hidden tag. Now, I could just as easily have put an image tag and then said alt equals a dark, destroyed cityscape image, blah, blah, blah. And the screen reader would have read it just the same. Okay? Also be sufficient. 
you don't even have to describe what it is. You know, just tell the intent of what that logo is to represent.
DQ.com <clears throat> is another one. Both very good sites, lots of blogs, lots of good reading material. DQ University has online courses available. Um, most of their courses are relatively inexpensive. I think you can actually get a one year subscription to every course for under $100. There's also been a number of accessibility myths put out over the years. Oh, making websites accessible is too expensive. Making a website accessible means you can't do any kind of really fancy stuff on your website. All myths. If you were to <coughs> sit down and say, I want to design a website, I need it to be accessible from day one and you sat down with your graphics artist, they said, okay, here's all this fancy stuff we're gonna do, we're gonna do you know, fancy JavaScript animation using HTML canvas and everything else. All of that can be made accessible. Now, you may not see the animation if you're a blind individual. Doesn't matter though. If you provide the information that that animation is a user in a way that is accessible, your site is accessible. Your normal, non-disabled individuals can see all the fancy graphics and news bank stuff that you want to give them, but your individuals with whatever disability they may happen to have can still get the context and all the information on the page, on the site that they need. Um, start from scratch. Clean, compliant code. It's also going to make, clean that code is going to be a lot easier to maintain. It's better for search engine optimization. Search engines are designed these days to go looking for a lot of the key points that are done inside accessible applications. Think about it. Um, you have a website designed with a lot of images on it. Great. How does the search engine figure out what those images mean? Technology isn't there yet to take an image and figure out what it means, especially in the context of where that image is. But all of a sudden, you start putting alt text associated with every one of those images, and now your search engines can look through your alt text and figure out what you've got on your page. Um, also, avoid legal issues. As I said, if you design a website, make it accessible, make sure you meet the standards or at least attempt to. Put a uh, site accessibility page on your site somewhere. Um, you may get email to the webmaster from lawyers or individuals or even organizations like National, National Federation for the Blind, but they're going to be a lot more sympathetic to you if you at least try. <coughs> Questions? Anything? Um, so I'm assuming for uh, videos, for example, if you have a video on the website, let's say for like a deaf person, I'm assuming that, that that also falls under uh, the yep. requirements that you have subtitles or something like that? Some, some titles and screen captures, um, captions, and they must be synchronized to the video. Okay, yeah. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because uh, there's, there's courses and also there's different uh, portals on, on our website. Um, for example, I don't know if it's still up there, but we have like a course for the new dorms. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like somebody speaking, describing like all the new features for the dorms while showing you a video with a tour of it. Uh, there was like no subtitles on it. So a person who was full staff would hear right. what, what the new, uh, what, what new addition they yeah. made to the dorm. So yeah, that's, that's something. Cool. Now, at the same time, for example, on your homepage, you've got a couple YouTube videos. It's quite possible for you to make your website accessible and put in your accessibility statement. Videos taken from an external source such as YouTube are not guaranteed to be accessible or not guaranteed to meet accessibility standards or whatever phrases you choose to put there. Because you have no control over something that you put on your site that comes from an external source. So, so long as you put a caveat that 
These things come from an external source. They're not under our control. They may or may not be accessible. You're covered. Any other questions? Anyway. Okay. Well, I thank you all for coming. Uh, anybody who is interested in this presentation, there is the link down at the bottom uh, where the slides are. The link right above it, the mwmarlow.com slash ally, is my neat little black website. Um, also, some of the information I've uh, gotten on this website came from a gentleman by the name of Dennis Boudreau, who works for DQ Systems in Canada. He was actually very helpful in some of the slides I stole directly from some of his presentations with his permission. And uh, check his site out as well. Right, so and I thank you all for it.